Thank you for attending. I'm, I'm actually somewhat surprised at the uh, number of the crowd tonight. I, I expected it to be swarming, but, um, but we appreciate all who have shown up. Um, I just want to let you know that we have a, a, a couple of items on the agenda tonight before we go into the FY 2015 budget that um, are sort of housekeeping type of items for the school committee. Um, I would just like to um, publicly state that um, the other evening at the City Council's finance um, meeting, um, I was extremely proud of our superintendent of schools. I thought she was uh, professional. Uh, she showed extreme passion, uh, heart, and I think expressed everything that is good about the Brockton Public Schools and the community. Um, and I just would like to state that publicly. She's, she's not here. She'll be here shortly. She had to um, go visit with uh, President Obama out in Worcester for that graduation. But um, again, I think that uh, she just showed us um, true, and, true and through what kind of person she is and that she really does support the schools and everyone involved with uh, the operations. So that being said, um, next item. Uh, Aldo, Medicaid reimbursement service provider. Yes, this is something um, that I'll bring on the agenda at the last minute because um, a few months ago during the bidding process, one of the items that we bid is the Medicaid reimbursement services, and it's uh, an, a three-year contract. And what happens with that contract is we have a company that bids, that comes in and looks at all of our Medicaid-eligible students and does the federal reimbursement program for us which in turn brings in funds. Those funds flow to the city side and eventually flow to us as part of our net school spending. For years, we had a company called PCG. I think, I don't know, like 15, 16 years. We had a company, a PCG Professional Consultant Group. They did this process for us. Um, this other company, New England Medical Billing, kept bidding against them, but um, their price was either higher or PCG's um, performance was, was something that overrode um, in the bidding process, the, 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 um, the requirements for the highest um, possible um, performance of a bidder. <coughs> so two years ago, New England, Medical Bidding, New England Medical Billing underbid PCG, and at that point, both companies were considered equal. So following the procurement laws, the contract went to New England Medical Billing. They've had that now two and a half years. They've done a good job for us. But in the spring, we rebid the contract like you do every three years. And this time, PCG underbid New England Medical Billing. So looking at the comparison of the two companies, we found both companies were, well, we've known both companies, so both companies were very favorable. Um, PCG actually had a little bit higher favorable rating because they have more larger school districts like Brockton. Um, but they also bid a lower price than when New England Medical Billing. So we awarded the contract to the best company with the lowest price, which was PCG. New England Medical Billing ever since has been emailing us, the mayor, the superintendent, wanting some sort of relook at the process and the bidding. And I've had many conversations with the vice president and the president there. Um, the, you know, their argument is they're a local company mm -hmm. and that, um, the, the, that since they came on, they found us more money and they work hard and they bring us in more money. I explained the entire bidding process to them. I also made the argument with them that you m brought us in more money because we brought you more students. We've grown over a thousand students in the time period since you've had the contract. I said, there is nothing on paper that shows that you're going to do a better job for us than PCG. Therefore, that being the case, the lower price contract, which is PCG, wins the bid. And we also found in our evaluation that now that both computer systems have, have been used, PCG has a certain computer software program and New England, New England Medical Billing has a certain software program. After using both, the staff has found that they like the PCG software better. So that also added into the fact that PCG was lower priced and their software was um, easier to use and, and, and more cooperative with, with how we use stuff. So, um, New England Medical Billing is trying to make an argument that it's going to cost you now to switch softwares and such, and I explained to him in detail that we get new electricians every year, we get new plumbers every year, we have outfits that know our buildings and know our services. We follow state procurement laws. 
and the state procurement laws say that you go with the best and the lowest price. And that's basically how this process went. That there really isn't a, a, a high cost to us to switch software, so if, if, if there's any cost to us, because we have both. So I told them I'd bring it up tonight so that if there is a reason why the school committee wants to throw out that vote and uh, that bid and start the whole process over, we would, but the process starts July 1st, and July 1st is coming quickly, and they have an opportunity in three years again to put another application in and, um, you know, undercut PCG, and at the same time, they would have to in, um, improve their performance in their software as such to win us over. So I brought it here tonight to see if anybody has interest in starting the whole process over and um, stopping what we've done already. Okay. Um, let me just quickly, I'll open it up to the committee in two seconds, but um, my uh, understanding of the laws <coughs> and the procurement laws are just what you stated, that the lower bid, so long as the company uh, qualifies through the bidding process, uh, is awarded the bid unless there is some extraordinary uh, item that stands out that would indicate that the lower bid is inadequate or unprepared or in unable to uh, meet the demand of our uh, of, of our um, RFP. So, um, you know, is there anything that stands out that uh, PCG uh, is uh, incapable of meeting our demands and requirements for this type of work? There's nothing that indicates that they won't do as well of a job as as um, doing the medical billing. I, yeah. I, I can't say that they will or they won't. Do. Right, but there's nothing on paper that you saw that jumps out at you that says this is a problem, even though they got the low bid, they're, they're, there's something that's got me concerned that they're not going to be able to meet the qualify, uh, Correct. the qualification. So, so basically Correct. on paper, as far as you're concerned, everything adds up that if, as long as they do the work, they've got the low bid. There's nothing that's giving you cause or pause to say we really shouldn't give it to this company. Correct. All right. So, um, I mean, we unfortunately have lost many vendors that we've used over the years. Um, you know, some local companies, and it breaks my heart that we lose them. But the laws are quite clear. And if we start opening this door up now, I think, A, we're going to lose the case. If, uh, if PCG <coughs> comes at us because we're in violation of the laws, which is going to make us liable and uh, held for damages, we open up the, the, the door for other companies uh, where we've done the same thing in terms of upholding the procurement law. Um, this is just a, a problem that I, I would never recommend that we, we violate from what the standard is, the, the accepted legal standard. Um, the, um, if, if in fact this company uh, over a period of time before the contract is up shows that they are incompetent and or unable to do the job, then we can take action to remove them uh, if in fact they, they can't uh, meet the demands of, of, of uh, the system. So um, we don't have to wait the three years if in fact we see that uh, they're, they're incompetent or unable uh, to perform. So. Um, Absolutely. I, I would say that um, my my, you know, if you're if my straw vote is that we do not um, do anything differently than uphold the procurement law that uh, the subcommittee uh, and the school committee who ratified this previously um, uh, how they acted. I wouldn't I wouldn't undo what we did. Anyone else, uh, Mrs. Joyce, and then Ray. If we were to reopen this. Would we be violating the procurement laws? We would have to reject the bid that we already accepted. On what basis? And, uh, there is no basis other than so one company. So how can we reject it? Y well, you, you don't I need don't understand why this is even coming to us, to be honest with you. If there's, a if there's a process that by law we have to follow, Yes. and the low and best bidder received the, the, um, the, the contract, right. why is it coming to, a, to you, us at all? You can reject for, for no reason at all, other than like we did with the modulars. We mm -hmm. didn't go forward with the project. You can reject it. If you feel that there's a chance that we can get a better deal if we rebid, then you can you can rebid, and that's what this vendor is kind of stating so is that. Now that this vendor knows what the other bids are, they can come back with a, with a stronger bid or a, a more lucrative bid for us. That's my concern, but, exactly. But then it goes out to bid for everybody. Yes. So PCG could come back with a lower bid as well. Exactly. But, so where are we vulnerable by doing that? Why wouldn't we want to do that then? Why would we want to go yeah, back out? Yeah, because if we can get a better bid from both of them. 
Well, um, I'm just being a devil's advocate here because if we reopen it and it's legal for us to do so, okay, number one, what's to prevent? Uh, are you, Ozzy? I have the floor. So you'll get your chance. So I'm being a devil's advocate. Right. So New England Medical comes to us. They know what the bids are. They want to reopen it. And if legally we can reopen it and receive a better bid from all of the companies, and it's going to cost us less money, and it's legal, why not do that? Unless Does it's not legal. Marginally. Marginally. Okay. <laughs> I, think, I think what the Inspector General would look at is, are we now basically exposing a price that other bidders who wouldn't have bid that now we're going to put in an even lower price that maybe aren't as qualified, because now they've seen the documents that they'll go out to bid on. And I think that's part of the reason why the Inspector General, Inspector General would look closely at something like that, where we have a price that's within our, um, I guess, set range of what we've been paying, mm -hmm. and it's even a little bit less. So mm -hmm. they would look at it as we're trying to, um, I guess, start a bidding war mm -hmm. where it allows a third party maybe to come in. Effectively, we are by doing so that. Exactly. So I wanted this on record because if New England Medical Billing were to file a complaint with the Inspector General, <coughs> I want to be able to say we've met as a committee, we approved as a committee, we read the concerns after the fact, and we basically held up our vote. And I think that is what um, keeps us out of any... I think it's important to vet this out. That's mm -hmm. why I'm bringing this up. And I agree with, with Tom that this is not a road that we want to go down. Right, because every vendor will want to. We want to keep it above board. We want, people, we want vendors to come to us with, ethically, their best price and their best service. Right. And not look to undercut anybody right. because if that's going to happen, then something's going to give. Right. And it will probably be service. So I agree with Tom that this is not a road we want to go down. I think it would be deemed an unfair business practice to, if we get into the habit of doing that when there's no, when there's no tangible basis to be, if, if both bids came in higher than we expected and the lower bid was the lowest bid but yet much higher than what we thought, then we could you know, reject all the bids. Paper. But we accepted the bid because it was within the range, within a reasonable range, it's within the range that we had previously been paying. I, I think we open ourselves to all sorts of problems. And we, whatever we're going to save, we're going to eat up in legal fees. And I think it's a waste of our so, time. Yeah. Um, yeah. Ray, and then, uh, and then Rozzy, and then Alicia. Elko, um, so I see here, you know, 5.85 versus 4.95. So that's the percentage of, of their fee? Correct. All right. So it looks like they're a full basis point higher than, than PCG. Um, what was their rate the last time? What was New England Medical Billings rate? Around the same, Mike, was it around the same, you think? It was around the same as what they bid. So they knew there was going to be an open bidding process, and they came in right around the same, knowing that a competitor would probably, to get the new business, lower their bid. Correct. So now they want a second chance to go <laughs> through the process again, which I think that ship has sailed. And, exactly. And I, I'd agree with Mrs. Joyce and Mr. Minotello. I, I just think it opens up a, a huge Ex can of worms, and as long as both businesses are in compliance with health care regulations. They both perform the same job. I can't see any reason why you wouldn't go with the PCG. Okay. I mean, if, if we were to open this up again, and they and New England billing went down to 4.85, and then PCG went down to 4.5, we'd be in the same process all over again. I just can't see them making up a full basis point. Right. Thank you. Um, Ozzy, and then we'll go to this side. We'll, we'll, we'll do it from side to side tonight. <laughs> Ozzy, <laughs> Mr. Jordan. Thank you. <coughs> I believe in the business it's called bid shopping, and that is against procurement law. Um, it's one of those, as was stated, kind of a moral, legally kind of thing, but when one looks at it, it definitely would not be accepted. There's no question on that, on a by review of whoever it may be. IG or somebody else, it, yes. it definitely wouldn't pass muster. And I have a motion when you're ready. 
Oh, okay. Um, well, we'll hear from the other members and then we'll entertain your motion. <coughs> Ms. Clark. Um, you know, being on the big review subcommittee, we, you know, although in the subcommittee we discuss this at length about, you know, the different programs and the pricing and what was best, what the school department was more comfortable with, and in the end they came out with PCG and being the best bid and you know, we supported that and brought it to the committee as a whole. And I think it would be going down the wrong road if we were to open this up and, you know, open it up to bids and bid shopping and, you know, just don't want to do that and bring it back to the subcommittee or you know, have us go down the wrong road for this. So I just support Tom. And Anyone else? Um, did you want to make a motion? <coughs> I move that we not reconsider the request by New England Medical Billing to re-examine the bid process. Second. Any further discussion? All in favor? Okay. All right. One down. Um, request from Mayor regarding funding in support for Summer Parks Program. Mr. Petronio? Yes. Um, that folder. In the Chartwell's contract, there are, if you don't mind, there's the newsletter, and then no, hold on, this one. In the, in the annual Chartwell's contract that we have, there are three sections in there that provide funding for the school department to use at our discretion. And um, it was something that wasn't, that we requested, it was something that they put in as part of their bid package to overall win the contract for our food services. Um, there's actually a few of them in there, um, one of which is a scholarship annually for $5,000. That's given to the scholarship committee and that's given out every year. The uh, items we're looking at tonight is there's three items. One is community initiative grant. One is a special events contribution. Another is an application for return incentive. These are all $5,000 each. And these are monies that are up to the committee's discretion to use primarily for some sort of community um, program, something that benefits all of our students. So the mayor's office made a request for some or all of these funds to go towards a new um, initiative that they're putting out, which is a parks program. They're looking to staff five playgrounds in the city, Gilmore, North Middle School, O'Donnell's, James Edgar Playground, and Ash Street Playground. They're looking to have two park instructors there from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m., Monday through Friday, from July 7th to August 29th. So he's looking for funding from various sources, and oh, ages 9 to 12 is what they're looking to target in the community. And so um, the mayor's office is looking for funding from various sources, and he's looking to see if there's any possible funding from the school department that can help um, offset the costs of those counselors. I assume that they're, they're college kids that they're hiring to do you know, baseball, kickball games, craft activities with them. Um, you know, d during those weeks, so there's a place for the kids to go. The school department does the summer lunch program at about 11 locations, and these five are five of the locations, so lunch will be provided every day at these playgrounds. Um, and these funds they've allocated are in the contract every year, so. What have we traditionally used those dollars for? Last year was the first time we got them. And we used them last year to go towards the initial of the iPad um, uh, giveaway that we did for lunch application processing. We did a, um, you know, so we did it. The a, total, a, so is, am I correct? In, there's 15000 there? $15,000. We used all 15000 last year for iPad incentives? Or? Yes, yes. Okay. And this year I've um, received a s small amount of grant money from the state for the school lunch initiative that I can use to cover that. 
to okay. continue that so program. So this year we can continue to incentivize that application process. Yes. But not have to use these funds to do it. Exactly. Are there any suggestions from um, our food service provider about how these funds are maybe used in other districts, or is this exclusive to our this district? Is ex the, I think this is right now exclusive to our district. Um, what they do, I mean, uh, in, in every area they go, they provide some investment income, which we have, which is what we're putting into those outdoor cafes that you've seen at the Davis, um, at the, um, what else would it be, outdoor cafes? The Davis and the, no, South, South. Raymond is on the list. Um, so the programs like that, scholarship monies, we we'll let them give a scholarship, so we have the $5,000 scholarship that goes to our scholarship fund. Is, is there any possibility of using this 15000 say, to bring some of the programming cuts that we've made back? Um, say, like the $5,000 to send kids over to uh, the Fuller Craft Museum or uh, it's at our the summer fest or it community schools program. It's at the community. It's at the, the school um, committee's discretion. Um, that's how all of them have been written. That it's at your discretion. So there's, n there's no limits to those funds. No. For so long as they're used on to benefit our student population. That's basically that's what they all are. Yes. So they okay. put it out there as three separate amounts, but. Do we need to make a decision on this tonight? Is that the request? Or well, the end of the year is coming. Chartwells has asked me, you know, you know what you're going to do with these funds because they pay them out in July. You know, from the, it comes off of the previous year. So the year ends and then they pay out the funds, um, but it's for the previous year. So they've asked, and I know the mayor's office brought this up um, a few months back, but I hadn't heard from them. And now we just, I received a letter a few days ago um, requesting this. I assume it's because the parks program is about to start up in about a month or so. Okay, so potentially we could even use this 15000 to say to benefit our own IT department that suffered some pretty significant cuts or? Well, I, I or, or guess, I mean, it's supposed to be like a community kind of outreach, or, you know, something. So maybe something like community schools or extended day program or, uh, you know, field trip mm -hmm. program that we hacked out of this year's budget because of, of what we're facing. Is it? It's again. It's up to. The, it's basically up to the school, you know, school committee's um, decision on how they want to, how they want to use it. I mean, uh, th I think their assumption is you want to impact as many students as possible. So. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Did you say that it may be a duplication at some of these schools with the with the luncheon program? Not the duplication. Part of the program. It's part of the program. I think the I think I'm I'm sure all five of these playgrounds are on the list of the summer um, lunch program. Because then my thought is is other pro there's other playgrounds. Is it possible to supply the lunch to some of the other programs, other playgrounds? Because they've done that in the past. Just yes. Ability, they just supply the lunch itself, and we'd be servicing more children that definitely could use the food during the summer times. So. We we do the every summer we look to as many locations as possible for the summer lunch to go to. Right. So that's something that's worked together, I think, with the guidance officer, with the parks department, and they try and come up with as many locations as possible. Because again, it's federally funded, so right. the more lunches we put out there, the better it is for all of us. Yeah, I think the only requirement is the kids have to eat the lunch on the playground. Yes. But when my thought again is, if, we, if these five playgrounds are going to have that, and this is additional money that would be utilized and if it's not the same money could we not spread it out to some of the other parks within the city just the lunch part of it so that kids could come in at that 11:30 hour or the 12 o'clock hour have their lunch eat it and go but at least we're feeding m more kids yes, the, lunch, the lunch piece of it we can put out as much as far as we want okay that, that doesn't cost anything that's not part of these five thousand dollar amounts right okay that, right. that's, that's for a separate once yeah. you set a site oh, up and it's an open site and it's automatic yeah. if for any child in the city that is 18 or younger you're correct that they have to <coughs> eat on site right. um, but there's no qualifier you could be the wealthiest child you could be the neediest right. child and it's open to everybody whether it's in our programs in the Brockton Public Schools the playgrounds right. as long as they are uh, noted as you know summer s uh, food service sites so that's not additional money exactly Okay. Exactly. This okay. is just primarily to cover the, 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 the salaries or the pay of those, um, I assume, again, they're college students. Okay. 
that'll be at East Playground and probably go towards, and high school kids too, and probably go towards, you know, some of the equipment, the dodgeballs, the, mm -hmm. the bases, the football, whatever equipment they buy. Okay. Kind of like, I mean, when I was a kid 40 years or so ago, um, you'd go to the park and there were the park instructors and right, right. you'd inside of our schools for instance like the George School has a playground you know the Raymond School th various playgrounds what I mean is I'm wondering if we could take this fifteen thousand dollars spread it out between the playgrounds that are in our schools and use that for repairs and maintenance to those playgrounds I get well I don't know how far fifteen thousand would go on repairs and maintenance but yeah, I think right. I think when it w the way it was written up and given to us in the contract it was for you know, interaction with, with the kids as opposed to us using repairs or right, well repairs and maintenance. I mean, I guess interaction with the kids is, is up for debate then because, it, you know, if the kids have a safer playground, um, that is, to me, interaction. I, I just find spending $15,000 when we could be using this in other, uh, in, in other situations a little, a little concerning. Um, I, I'm not that familiar with the program, but I think what the mayor's intention is to have kids go to a place and stay rather than get out and get in trouble. But have couldn't a, we I do this? That's couldn't he do this with volunteers? I, I'm, I'm just. I, mean, I got his letter. Isn't that what a community I is supposed to do? Have volunteers and spend their time volunteering? And I, I guess. Messenger. Yes. Yeah. I mean, uh, not to beat up on you by any means. I just find this very concerning given the staff. Well, reductions and, <laughs> and the cuts that we're making to all of these programs to ask for $15,000 for something else is, is, is troubling. But that's my two cents. Okay. Well, the 15000 comes directly from Charwells. It doesn't come from our money. Oh, I know, it's but if it can corporate. be used to bring back other technology or, or, or staff or, or you know, community schools or anything else, I'd much rather spend it on that than, than something that's outside of of the school system. Okay. Mrs. Joyce? I think it's obvious that this, the timing of this request is probably not the best. If it had come last year, he probably would have had a much easier time getting it through. Mm -hmm. But I do have a couple of questions on the request itself. Um, has he explained how many staff members he's looking to hire to, to manage this or to run the program? Well, I spoke to the chief of staff. Um, Robert Buckley, mm -hmm. and what he said was two at each of the locations, so that would be ten staff and one supervisor. And they're basically okay. doing a five-hour day. So nine, 15, nine 15 people for five hours. And are these uh, staff Actually. members going to be quarried? I would, I would, um, I guess they would have to be. I mean, we didn't. Can he assure us that they are? going to be quarried. You would have to, because they have the Broughton After Dark program, which uses our schools and uses the tennis courts at Broughton High mm -hmm. in the soccer field. Um, they have all those volunteers and employees have to be quarried okay. every year. So I think this is, they're trying to do the After Dark program for younger oh, kids yeah. during the day. This is with the parts program. That's how it was explained to me. And how many activities at each location is he looking to run? Or is that kind of loosely I, organized? Th th that wasn't given to me. I don't know, as I asked, I mean, okay. I asked what hours, so that nine to one, which is actually four hours a day, how many days per week, and how many weeks for the summer? Nine to two? Nine to one. Nine to one, four hours. Four hours. Okay. Nine to one. And lunch is included within that four hour span? I think lunch is at noon time. Noon time, okay. And we don't know how many activities, so we don't know how many children we're servicing. We don't. I just, when I looked at where the playgrounds are located, it looks like it's the, you know, kind of like the main corridor of the city down the center. Mm -hmm. So, but I, again, I think it's something that he started and is just wants to look at doing, but. And how will our children know about this program? It's hey. possible to go through the mayor's office, the outreach, the sign-ups, like they do with Brockton After Dark. Okay, so it will be advertised on the Brockton Public Schools website, on the city's website. Um, will there be, I mean, how will the outreach happen? 
Or are the kids just going to show up? I don't know. I, I think, you know, first of all, we, we always certainly cooperate with the city mm -hmm. and, you know, advertise on our website, especially Brockton after dark. I just don't want to hire all yeah. these people, 15 people to stand around with no kids showing up and dole out $15,000 to do it. You know, there has to be a concerted <coughs> effort to get the kids there and a plan to get them there. On, on your point, um, Patty, you know, this letter from the mayor is basically saying, I'm also engaging other organizations for support of this program. I don't think he's looking for us to fund the whole thing. No, I just want to know yeah. how the kids are going to get there and right. find out about it. So uh, I guess my point is maybe we can consider donating a small piece, a portion, as a mm -hmm. contribution and goodwill on our part, and, um, and we keep the majority of funds and we decide as a committee how those funds should be utilized because it's obviously the first time I think the committee is aware of this benefit because you know you said that I remember last year that you were giving out the iPads for gifts but I never asked well where's the money coming mm -hmm. from I, I, I wasn't mm -hmm. sure of the source um, I figured you'd have it somewhere in the budget but um, so now we know this is where the money came from so my suggestion is and, and all your concerns are very valid but I, I would say that we consider donating and contributing because it, they are our kids that are going to be serviced however and how many we're not sure but we donate a, a little piece and we keep the majority of the money for ourselves for our system in some way shape or form that we collaborate together and figure out what the best use of that money is so, but can I finish absolutely okay thank you so my concern is that we're looking at cutting $5,000 here, $6,000 there in our budget, and we get this $15,000 request of funds that we didn't know existed until tonight. And I don't know how the mayor's office found out about it. I'd love to know the answer to that. And um, I'd like to know who's managing it in the mayor's office. Comes who's running the program? Comes under Cora and Capiello, okay. which is, I don't know what her... Well, she runs the grants, correct? What's her position? I don't know what her exact title is. Okay. Uh, Community Outreach, I think, is her yeah. title. Um, I I'm think sure. philosophically it's a good program, and I agree with, with what he's trying to do, but there's nothing worse than a bad program that's mismanaged and that kids don't take advantage of because it's just let's put it out there, let's put the money after it, but let's not manage it properly. So he's asking for the money, and he should know better than anybody else that we're going to ask these questions because he sat next to me and asked those questions for four years. So he should, he should be prepared to answer these questions. Mm -hmm. So as a result, I'm not inclined to entrust $15,000 with all these questions. So if he wants to come back to us and answer these questions, then I'd probably be more inclined to advocate for the funds. That's how I feel if, about if it. If you want, we could bump it to the school committee meeting as an agenda item. Sure. And I assume Maybe we'll be at the next meeting. Maybe you can give him a list of questions that we have. Mm -hmm. Maybe he can come prepared at the meeting. Thank you. Okay. Um, anyone else for a comment? All right, so do we have consensus then that we'll, did you have a comment? Is, is there, the deadline is the end of this fiscal year to choose what we do with this money? Or? Not really, we can go right into July. Because the chart wells has to wait for the year to close out. In other words, these funds are available if they meet the guarantee that they've guar they promised us. They've already met the guarantee. So we know come June 30th, when they close out their books, they've already met it. So that's when chart said to me, the money's now available. Okay. So, but they usually pay it out in July, waiting for the June 30th figures to be certified. So likely m more urgent for the mayor than for us. It just seems like maybe this is important. Oh, sure. Okay, so do we have consensus? We'll roll it over to the school committee as an agenda item. Okay, good. Uh, next item. All right, FY 2015 recommended school department budget. Okay, what I've done for this meeting is updated the sheets that we've been working on, try and make it easier to follow. I put them on legal size paper because even I'm having problems reading some of the small print now. So, um, the sheet that's entitled Proposed Budget Reductions that's got red and green coloring on it, what we did on that was we initially, the first round of cuts, 
you know, we cut out about five or six million dollars worth of cuts, and then the second round of cuts, we did the same thing. So to give you everything at a glance, I put it all on one sheet. So anything that's in red, we cut the first time we went through the budget. That brought us from the superintendent's recommended budget. It brought us down to a level services budget. Then anything that's in green brought us from the level services down to the mayor's recommended budget. So every cut is listed on the sheet of what we've made. Um, and now we're looking at, so I call that round one, round two. Now I think we're looking at what we're calling round three. What are the cuts we can make to, um, again, look at calling back teachers and other staff. So that sheet is, is again, for you to review as we, as we discuss. The other sheet which we've been working off of, I put a column on it that on the far right is now <coughs> set up on the screen above us with some additional lines put in it. And Mike Bandis, if we come up with other cuts we want to make, he'll put them in the sheet behind us and it'll tally it at the bottom to tell us where we are um, in total. Right now, that right-hand column, the way it stands without any updates yet, has us at, um, but has us calling back approximately 163 positions to the teachers union and out of 170 we spoke of. Since we last met formally, um, going through the teachers who have been on leave and have the ability to return, we've had to make um, posts, you know, in the in positions in the budget for them. So you'll see about the fifth line down in bright yellow, I put teachers returning from leave, additional costs. So we originally were calling back what we said was 170 teachers and we had 29 vacant positions. I mean, not 20, vacant, 29 still outstanding. Well, we have to factor in those seven. So we now have 36 um, positions that still need to be filled out of the BEA union, uh, factoring in those seven. So I just basically rebalanced the sheet. So instead of having 29 outstanding, we have 36 outstanding. And the rest of the cuts are now basically open for discussion as far as how far we go. I, I from the meeting Monday night with the city council, my personal take on it is if we are going to receive any additional funding from the city, we might not receive it until the fall because I think it will take that long to do it. So I think now we have to discuss strategically how we're going to manage the budget between now and the first day of school. Mr. Bicarno, when you say that until the fall, can you explain to everybody, so there were two options. Yes. If the mayor were to increase taxes, that is something that would happen right away. That is not the fall, correct? It could go through correct. to the fall. What it is is in November of every year, the tax rate mm -hmm. of the city is certified by the Department of Revenue. So Mr. Condon's office would prepare all of the estimates for all of the revenue the city is going to receive, everything from motor vehicle excise taxes, boat taxes, personal property taxes, um, new development, all of that gets certified by the Department of Revenue in the fall. In those estimates, you can then also put in what you're going to receive if you decided to raise taxes, raise wa water fees, raise, you know, raise sewer rates. So between now and then, that issue it c is still basically open. Now, a budget was submitted without um, the need of the 2.5% increase in taxes and additional increase in water rates if, if necessary. So the City Council can go through and pass the budget as it stands if they decide between now and the fall to implement, or the mayor would have to decide, and the city council will have to approve it, an increase in taxes or uh, balancing the water department budget so that it's uh, self-sustaining, which in turn would, would pay money back to the city that it owes it, those funds uh, then become available. So by before you submit to the state what you're doing with the funds, in the past what's always happened is that money just goes into the stabilization account. By the time you submit the tax rate, you have further information usually on new development. So when the Westgate Mall added the additions on up there, I think there was an extra 700000 that was now calculated because their permits were pulled and they were approved. That money come the fall is either appropriated to a body, it could have been appropriated for a fire engine, or what's usually done is it just it gets appropriated and goes into the stabilization account. So between now and then, any of those options can happen. But nothing's going to happen before June 30th on any of those matters. So 
knowing that, I think we have to try and balance our budget with 160 million that we received, and again, be st as strategic as possible in um, filling the, the the vacancies or or calling back the positions that best suit our mm, you know first day of school the, the, as we know it, uh, September 1st. So, compliance issues. Um, any any area that's really understaffed that you feel is necessary. So, um, if it means, you know, uh, raising class size in the third grade uh, to meet the fourth and fifth grades to balance the budget, then I think that's what needs to be discussed. Okay. So when we last left, um, okay. Question. Sorry. Uh -huh. process, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, you had mentioned if the mayor chooses to raise taxes, which we don't. S I don't personally see that happening. Can the city council, um, do they have the, the power to, um, to put forth raising taxes, or does that only come from the mayor? I think that only comes from the mayor. Okay. Okay, so For they sure. can't just go outside of, of him and decide as a body to raise taxes. Right, I don't think they can. Okay, thank you. So I just wanted to clarify that. I, I think you know to follow up on that. The I think they were making that point the other evening to all of us that you know their option was to either reject the budget or accept it as presented. There were things that they were able to do. It was not the raising of taxes 2.5 percent. It was things such as a resolve on the water rates. Um, but as we said, that's not something that seems to happen right away. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know we have had discussions, and and we're hopeful and will continue to have those discussions. When we last left here, we had talked about um, through all of the cuts that we made uh, in, and I guess uh, I'm trying to see which round, Mr. Petronio. So I believe it's the third round, correct? That's Looking tonight. The sheet. Mm -hmm. So we had brought back, we had looked at 154 teaching positions that affected the classroom immediately. You sent us back to the drawing board. At the time, I was looking to keep some money out for uh, some compliance issues. We went back to looking at certified staff. So with the money that we identified in the third round of cuts, we are at 154 teaching positions. We had already identified an additional nine based on those same monies. We added in the seven teachers that are coming back from leave. So at this point here, we still have, as Mr. Petronio stated, 36 certified staff members out and all of our other non-certified staff members that we had uh, reduced uh, reduction in force also are still out. So you asked us to go back to the drawing board. You were concerned again um, in your informational packet. We sent to you those remaining positions so you could see what some of the positions were. Uh, adjustment counselor, uh, adult learning center, art, bilingual, there were elementary positions, an English position, uh, guidance counselors, health, mathematics, music, phys ed, science, uh, administrators. So there were 36 uh, of those positions uh, not recalled. Uh, and when we went back to the drawing board right away, and I believe it was Wednesday and Thursday, we spent quite a bit of time right, right through Friday. And we went back and again looked at every single budget, uh, a line item in the budget. And you know, regrettably, we have some additional recommendations that start to dig deeper and deeper into the core and to the services that we provide for our students. Um, I sent you something in the informational packet um, last Friday. Um, so I'd like to go over those with you now. The first group, uh, again, this is employees. So this is 20 parent liaisons that service our elementary uh, and our middle schools. And that was to the tune of $221,000. Uh, again, I want you to know, and you heard me talk about this the other night, parent liaisons have been with us since somewhere around 2001. They provide a valuable service you know, to our school community, to our families. Um, when you actually heard me talk in the entry plan, you heard me talk about growing that. You heard me talk about advocacy centers and bringing on additional parent liaisons. But uh, I did have an opportunity last Thursday uh, to meet with parent liaisons. Um, they asked a lot of questions. I told them how diligently we were working to try to save as many positions as we could. But at this point here, it would be a recommendation. 
The second one is uh, freshman sports, including transportation for the sports. That is $40,000. And the goal we were trying to reach, by the way, at the time was $950,000. Uh, with Before the okay. seven, um, call seven leaves, leaves came collapse. back. So there's actually, it's over a million dollars to bring back the 36 and yes. allow us some of the compliance positions also. So freshman sports was $40,000 we identified. We cut elementary intramurals for 58,000. Middle school, middle school intramurals, which again, I will remind everybody, you know, we kept that in the budget because of having reduced the middle school sports. That's at 84,000. Um, we had kept sports equipment. Some of that you asked us to increase, and that was again for the intramural so that more students could uh, play. I think we went from six, and you asked us to put back in an additional 10, which we had done in, the, in that third uh, round of cuts. Um, the Parent Information Center is going to have abbreviated hours. Uh, Soraya DeBarros did an excellent job of at least giving us an accounting, uh, a very particular about who would be there, what the times would be. We would let parents know uh, immediately, not just the hours that we would ex exist or be open, but also if their paperwork was in and completed, it's not something that would be a quick turnaround. It might take a day or two. We would try very hard to continue with the same excellent customer service, but it will be affected. Um, after school program, we uh, identified another position and we're going to actually uh, centralize that in a particular office that does after school for the transportation for the regular day. We'll stay on and um, for any after school program that's going on, excuse me, transportation. We, uh, again, when you talk about um, your restructuring committee, you've heard about that for a long time. That is the professional development that goes on on Saturdays, I believe some after school at Brockton High School. Uh, it certainly, I think, has had a lot to do with their professional development and developing strategic plans or looking at initiatives that are going on in the school. It presently was a $40,000 item. It now would be uh, reduced <coughs> by $20,000. Um, I, I will say that um, probably the biggest item that you're going to see here, and, and although we do work as a group with our executive directors who, like you, have put in a lot of hours, uh, Dr. Murray was the one that, that recommended that we look at reducing an amount per student. So it, it's different for the different levels, but if we were spending $55 or $75, depending on the level, to reduce that by $20, per pupil, we would able, uh, be able to uh, have uh, $340,000. Now, you know, is that something that'll be difficult for us? It will. We will have to use up every supply that we have. We'll have to be uh, very efficient. Um, you know, teachers, again, will have to know that, you know, like, like any family tightening their belt, this would be something that, that clearly would affect some of the things that we do in the classroom. I won't tell you that I'm not concerned because I'll tell you right now, teachers go out there and spend a lot of their own money as we speak. You know, they're out there buying additional supplies. They're out there buying backpacks for kids that come in without things that they need. So when I do say that, I am concerned about it. it to bring people back, though, was, I, you know, cer certainly worthy of taking a look at. Um, when I put here, I, I'm, I'm working with Mr. Macrina uh, again. When I contacted Mr. McCreener in the music department, and all of you know what that means for our kids, um, he gave me a list of things that we could certainly have discussion about. I haven't been able to sit down with him and start to identify dollar for dollar what those cuts will be. But I will tell you, one of the things we right away said, um, there are some uh, certainly music programs um, or uh, uh, symphony programs, jazz ensembles. There are things that, that again, we're trying to hold harmless. The marching band is something we all enjoy. You know, it's out there for community events. It's out there for the Memorial Day Parade we just marched in. You know, it's out there for, you know, who doesn't want to come to the Brockton High football game? Never mind to see our band in that first show, but also when you go to other places, that shows people what happens at Brockton High School. You know, not just inside our classrooms, but also what our kids are able to accomplish. So one of the things we talked about right away was they would not travel to any of the away games this year. That would be a savings, and, and I know, Mr. Thomas, you're talking four buses go with our kids, and it's, it's the marching band, it's the majorettes, it's the halftime dancers, it's the flag bearers, it, it's, it's the whole ensemble. So I would like to be able to get back to you on that to give you a more accurate accounting, but make no mistake <coughs> about it. Now, now we're into some of our, our fine and performing arts, and, and, and that should concern every one of us. 
And we, we're continually looking at race to the top money with monies that are left. We're, we're looking for end of the year payrolls. We've used that for the Edison Academy, for a number of things that have gone on in the district. You know, and, and unfortunately we know that that's affecting us by that grant coming to an end. So we have identified about 80,000. We will tell you tonight we continue to look at every dollar. But at this point, uh, that brought us up to $909,614,000, which again would allow us to start to bring back um, those additional positions that you want us to bring back. And uh, further discussion about the um, school resource officers, the 125,000. I mentioned it to the mayor at the last school committee meeting. And he said that, um, you know, that's a request we'd have to make of him. Do we need to do that in writing now? What do we need to do? We would I need I to I yes. I, I believe what he said is it doesn't come back in Chapter 70 money for us. Right. It would be a supplement. Okay. So it, we, we, we don't have the obligation of the $125,000. In order to get that back, we would have to ask the mayor in writing. Right. It, it, they'd have to make a supplemental appropriation. What happens now is by cutting that out, let's say the city owes us a million dollars next year because, you know, they've underfunded us this year. They would now owe us a million one hundred and twenty-five thousand next year. So my request was, well, you're going to owe it to us next year. I'd like to request it this year so you don't owe us that in addition. Right. So, and then the right. discussion Can we get right on that tomorrow and send him a letter immediately mm -hmm. requesting that money? And, and tell them that we want to we want to be able to utilize it for this budget. Um, one other thing, one of the things I would like to discuss with the committee um, um, is the substitute budget that we have. Um, we um, initially came in with, and correct me if I'm wrong, <coughs> Mr. Petronio, but we were talking about one million ninety thousand, and then. There was the recommendation to reduce it by 250, correct? Correct. So that would bring us down to what, about 840,000? Seven, 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 eighty, seven, eighty. All right. So if, um, right, but in that, go ahead. In that cut, what we had discussed was <coughs> not calling substitutes for the high school and middle school level. Right. The okay. two hundred and fifty thousand that we cut out of the budget. Correct. Okay. If um, if we um, considered cutting it again by another couple of hundred thousand dollars and um, utilize that money to bring back personnel um, who could fill in as substitutes in the buildings, um, sort of be floaters, um, you know, through the MTAs or the paras or what have you. Um, is that something that maybe we could come up with some sort of a plan to work? So it's not just shifting them, it's not just subtracting the money, it's subtracting the money but putting it in another um, column, so to speak, and bringing in resources through that column to meet the needs. Um, so you'd shift the funds and use it to bring back a certain number of positions that are basically full-time substitutes correct. slash teachers. Yeah, and, and they might have to move go from a building to a building or something close by or they might be you know depending on the type of school it is spending you know some part of the day here and then another part of the day there or I don't know I mean something to consider and I wanted to talk to my fellow committee members about it mm -hmm. um, I, I don't know I mean enough of <coughs> how the schedules work um, but maybe Mr. Murray could talk a little bit about that as well if I may absolutely gone through in the negotiations on these um, on these groups is that there is contractual language within their contracts about substitute pay um, and I, I think it's important for us to understand what the obligations are if we call them as, as subs if they're a para or an MTA and the cost um, associated with that um, we may not realize I understand the theory behind it, and I think it's a good idea, but we do have contractual language that we have to consider. 
So Mrs. Joyce, in the contracts we have language, and, and you're correct that if an MTA in their regular position is asked to step in and be the teacher in a classroom, there's a differential in yes, pay there that is. they get. Yes, there is. Okay, I'm not exactly sure what it is. It, it's, yeah, well, it, I think it's a different, <coughs> it's, a, it's different in the Paris contract, which is under negotiation right now, by the way, and also the MTAs. They each have their own language. So I think we need to kind of vet through that before we make a decision. Mr. Robinson? I'm all set. Thank you, Andy. Um, given that potential complication or, or issue to address, what about the idea of shifting that money to, say, like a specialist, music or art? I don't know if there would be any benefit. I know one of the things we talked about is if we're not able to get all the specialists back, those periods could turn into study periods or, or you know, combined periods. Um, you know, at, at maybe you can look at both kind of options or even some sort of combined option. Um, you know, if we bring back a couple art teachers as opposed to four paras, we don't have to maybe deal with the contractual language. Those art teachers could float between one or two schools and, and fill gaps, not less as a substitute, but more to kind of prevent some of those things. I mean, I, I know that's kind of how some of our schools use those specialists, not only to provide the content, but to, you know, and then you have real, you know, not to say that our pairs aren't, but, but you don't have a substitute curriculum happening. You have like a, you know, a legitimate professional mm -hmm. teaching curriculum happening, a, a year-long planned curriculum. I, I just feel like we're losing things like sports and, and things like that if we can repair some of the arts or the music or other specialist programs that way. Um, I, don't, I don't know if that's a possibility, but just popped into my head as we were kind of thinking through it. So, well, you're, uh, so you're saying if, if a math teacher is out today, then all those math classes become an art class? The kids, instead of attending just a study hall or a yeah, I mean, substitute? I, I don't, I don't know how it would work, but but that it can be that it can be backfilled with some sort of educate you know educational content besides a, a study hall or just a subfolder, you know some worksheets or a movie or what I don't you know I don't know how that happens how that works what you know I know teachers work very hard to prepare for when they have substitutes but we all know kind of how that is adjusted based on the day and when this you know when the substitute teachers called in, you know, ahead of a vacation week or right, right behind a vacation week, how that looks different. If we can have a professional teacher in that position that has, like, prepared lesson plans and the specialties, you know, it's almost like a field trip, right? I mean, it, it would almost be like a field trip. The kids would just get some specialized content for that day, a one-shot deal, whether it's a, you know, I, I don't know if that can work. It's, it's, it's whether it's a teacher or an MTA, and I'm hearing both sides. It becomes, if somebody's out, it, it, even if it is a teacher, it's a, a, a substitute teacher for whoever is out. But they have some kind of a planned curriculum, I think, is what you're saying. Yeah, so for, for like an art teacher to have, you know, 20 lesson plans, right, that they can call on various grade levels, especially if that school doesn't have a specialist back and now they don't have an art class. You know, if there's a sub day versus getting a subfolder assignment or ending up in the cafeteria, just hanging out or in the gym, you know, doing something. They can sit in front of an art teacher. I mean, the art rooms aren't, you know, we're not selling off the art equipment and we're not, you know, if we can reutilize those things and, and have a one, one time, you know, art thing or music thing or whether it's music history or art history or an actual project based something, you know, I don't know. It's just a, just a thought. I mean, it's better than having kids sit in a cafeteria or watch a movie. And going back to, to Mrs. Joyce's point, so, you know, we have contract language. If we're able to, I think the idea, Mr. Minicello, is if we have, I'm just going to use MTAs right now. If we have a number of MTAs that are still laid off at this point, I don't know if we'd be able to talk to them about those that we'd be able to call back within this $200,000, and their job would be specifically, you know, to substitute, to be a permanent substitute in a building, so to say, or between buildings until we're able to, yeah, I, don't, I don't know I if that's don't know something if we can. I will allow us to do that right. or not, but we can certainly talk to the union and see Co what would be allowed to do and mm -hmm. what we wouldn't be allowed to do by the contract. They had, it's a new contract. They weren't under contract last right. year. 
so we had a little more flexibility last year than we do this year. Um, can I just ask one thing on what Andy was saying? I like that idea, but if on the 36 that are left, we have five art teachers, three health teachers, three music teachers, and six phys ed teachers. And when I was talking to Mr. Murray, his concern was that these are classes within his in his schedule. The, the kids are in these classes. Mm -hmm. So if we're cutting these these um, bodies, these you know these people from these classes, where are these kids going? Is that exacerbating our substitute issue? Well, so although not core subjects, the same principles would apply to an art class or a music class. Uh, if the, there's no teacher for that room, and you have 20, 22, 25 students who are going to have to be placed in some other classroom at that time. The possibility exists that you could end up having a study hall or a gym with 60 students in but it. But they still need to have a, somebody in there with them. Correct, but instead of having uh, you know, one uh, professional for 20, 25 students, you may have one professional for 60. And much to Mr. Robinson's point, uh, if it's a, an art class and they all end up in music, they're not going to be getting any art and probably mm -hmm. not as much music as we like with, with a, a classroom full of people. I think the idea behind um, the, the substitute uh, concept was to try to create a fixed dollar amount in terms of substitute costs at the high school and at the middle schools, knowing full well that it wasn't going to resolve all of the issues, but then that way we could get a better handle on and create a more specific amount for the elementary classrooms where it's much more difficult to accommodate that classroom of 28 students if the teacher's not there instead of spreading, spreading them out. They really need subs in that, that classroom. They do. You're right. So I think uh, when we're looking at this next round of recalls, it is very important to consider the, the classroom impact at, at mm -hmm. the middle and the high school level in terms of numbers. And that is those positions that those I just mentioned. Those would be those specials, exactly. Okay, exactly. so it's really critical we get those positions back because basically these kids have no place else to go during those time frames. You're going to end up doubling up somewhere in, in somebody's building in, in some form of the schedule, yes. And they're not being... They're not in the classroom. We they're have great teachers, <laughs> but I think you'd be asking an awful lot. And, and they'll get great instruction if it's in that music room, but they won't be getting the art. Um, okay. Or they won't be getting uh, the tech ed or whatever, you know, or the phys ed. I mean, it's, yeah. it, it would be that kind of thing. Okay. Can you see if you approve whatever amount you approve in the cuts that we've recommended? Can we see how many we get to bring back? We can start to actually bring yeah. back the, the, yeah. those classroom specialists. So by bringing some of those people back, it actually kind of helps us to be able to cut more substitute pay if we have to. Yes, yeah. but it's not a total cut. It's the taking from here, but putting right. here. Yeah. So I'm, my goal is to preserve and to bring back as many of our personnel as possible, mm -hmm. and at the same time providing the building with some stability. So if you have an MTA or a para or someone that's qualified who is assigned to the building, well, they certainly are going to have um, experience, know the kids. Yep. It's not going to be like just some stranger walking in. There's, you know, and, and they're going to have, there's going to be, um, I would say, just a, a more experienced person who's familiar with the building, familiar with the kids, familiar with the teachers, can really interact with the, the staff and say, okay, what's the best way to affect this rather than just someone coming in off the street as, as a... I don't know. I, I just, to me, well, feel like it'll be Tom, better think, instruction that way. And I think it might really be worth talking to the MTAs about that possibility. I mean, it's not a perfect solution, but yeah. we're trying to find solutions right. to make a bad situation a little better, mm -hmm. you know? Um, Mr. Henningsen, are you done? Mr. Yes, I am. Mr. Henningsen. Um, so the public has an idea, and so I, I have an idea as well, because I'm certainly a new member here. Uh, can you tell me what the average current per day pay is for a substitute teacher? Eighty-five dollars per day. And what are typically the qualifications of a substitute teacher? Do they need a bachelor's degree or? No, they need to have two, either an associate's degree or uh, two years completed of college credit. Two years completed. Okay. And 
are these costs that we pay are they s standardized across you know the state or is it is it something yeah actually i think we're actually a little low we're actually uh, low the average is about a hundred dollars a day uh throughout the region so do we have problems getting subs then um, it depends on the time of year. Um, this time of year, when your colleges get out in early May, you have plenty of subs because you have kids that are, have finished um, their second year of college, and a lot of uh, Brockton High students or Brockton residents that have uh, fall in that category will come back and sub for us. Um, Many of them have been college teaching assistants for a yeah. couple of years for us in their summer programs. Yep, exactly. So it depends on the time of year. They, obviously, in the in the in the dead of winter, it's hard to find subs because it's just obviously the kids are in college. Some of them do come back to us in yeah. the, if they have a long break in January. This they'll sub, but it depends on the time of year. But it's it's the it's not easy finding um, a lot of substitute teachers. And based on this cost, it doesn't look like there's any play in that in that price anyway. You'd even have a harder time finding subs if you lowered that rate to 80 or whatever it is. Yeah. I, I was actually going to this year ask for an increase in it. Um, even a number of our members that are retired um, who are willing to come back and sub, but by the time you take out taxes, et cetera, it's, it's less than $50. It. And, and they had even requested that we take a look at honoring their service. And especially they can just step into a classroom, many of them, and, and just take over, whether it's you know understanding the culture or preparing the lesson. Um, so that's not where we're at right now, but I was intending to, to speak to the committee about that. Thank you. Do we want to um, go through the process, basically the math? But I'd let you know, again, we've, we've put some numbers out there. As you approve them or have discussion, we can go to the board and we can start to bring back some of those 36 positions that you asked us to go and identify deeper cuts to bring back those positions. And of course, th it might allow us to, to see what we have left. Mm -hmm. So can we, um, can we agree then that we um, reduce the sub-budget by another 200, but we figure out after we do a little bit of due diligence what the effective way to implement that shifting of money? It's not like we're just subtracting it and not adding it somewhere. It's sort of just a, an, uh, an accounting exercise. I'm looking at our board accountant here. <laughs> so shifting. it's just shifting, really. We're spending the money. Yeah. It's just being spent in another column. So you're saying take 200 out of subs, but then go to, to personnel. But we're not sure exactly what how it's going to. It's going to go to personnel, but we're not That's sure right. what type of which column it's going in or how it's being distributed. Right. An additional 200. So are you you're saying right away, Mr. Minicello, well, you're going to go through each of these cuts I'm going to gather, mm -hmm. the ones mm -hmm. that we've, okay. That'll be another cut. We're p adding 200,000. Yep. Can I make a little different suggestion? I mean, if, if the only place we really need to preserve the subs, like where it's like an absolute must is the elementary school, could, could we look at it the other way? Like, what do we need at the elementary level and then just take the rest, whatever that number is? I, I'd hate to just throw in an arbitrary number, yeah. say 200, and if there's 300 there, there's 350 there, or there's only 125 there. I, I don't know if it's possible for you to analyze, what do we need to, to preserve the subs at the elementary school? Can you and tell then us that? What's left? Um, See, that's always been a mystery to us. Yeah. We, well, we have discussion about this in coming right. up with a way, because we use substitutes for professional development, because it's very costly, again, to have teachers come back at, at later time, or we had even looked at this election day coming up. We had looked at that for an opportunity for a full day of professional development, and it was costly. So a lot of times what we'll do, it's less costly to bring in a substitute, and we'll, we'll pull teachers during the day for some of their trainings. So we haven't been able to separate professional development from actual absences um, in the other area. Right. For the, the need for substitutes? Right, I'm sorry, for the different levels? Is it, it's not divided oh, it's by? It's not divided by. The, the, the problem with putting together a budget is you never know how many absences are going to be called in. Yeah. So my thought is that we allocate a certain amount of money to substitutes for elementary 
once that money's gone, no more substitutes get called in. So you could enter into uh, March and you have absences in your building and there are no substitutes. You now have to take the kids and either put them in the cafeteria or you're going to spread them out to the other classrooms. Because if we're going to maintain a budget every year, we go over the substitute line item by hundreds of thousands of dollars, yet we can't mandate that someone come to work if they say they're sick. Yeah, no, I mean, I get that. And, and I, I, I get the idea of like preserving the cushion in that, you know, I mean, I, I would say like I'd be looking for a very conservative estimate, not, you know, right. not, well, not trying to sap well, every penny out of it, but. The problem is there is no cushion in that budget right now. That budget every year is overexpended. Yeah. We never, we never fully fund but, it to what. But is it, a, but, but it's possible, right, that, you know, and I, I'm not doing this, saying this to place blame, but it's possible that it's overexpended because of, Who's, who's calling in the subs, right? Some of the sub rates are higher, right, than others. I mean, I'm, I'm looking at this, you know, in some cases, like if it's a special ed classroom, it's a little bit higher rate. If it's, a, if it's one of our retired teachers, it's a little bit higher rate, right? And so it, it, it could be, if, if we're looking at eliminating subs, or basically we've already said we're not going to have subs for the high school and the middle school, right? So if the high school and middle school were the, were the, were the levels that we're sapping, a big portion of our sub budget for whatever reason mm -hmm. and the elementary school wasn't we, we may have more than we thought or we may not have the same problem be, you know and, and to some degree um, you know it, it would make some logical sense that maybe our elementary teachers are a little bit more thoughtful because of the impact it has on their classroom that it doesn't have at a, at a class level where the kids are in multiple classrooms over, over the course of the day versus teacher being there all day um, for example mm -hmm. um, so it's pot you know I would I would gander a guess that our middle school and high school saps more of our sub budget than our elementary school does generally possibly and so there may be more room there if, if really the only places where we're allowing subs is elementary school we're allowing people to call it sick at the high school in the middle school we're just not replacing them with a sub anymore right um, the thought is have one at each house at the high school and one at each middle school, a permanent. So that will give this the, but the you know principal some flexibility. But you know what I'm saying, right? I mean, we, we may. Right. If, if you may if have no one out elementary if at the all. Elementary, right? The elementary school may only be using 15 or 20 percent of that budget, mm -hmm. and the rest, you know, the other 70 or 80 percent might be. I don't know if there's a way for us to disaggregate that and figure out what, le you know, say a, a three-year average of what levels are. I don't know if Subfinder has the ability to do that quickly and easily. Yeah, we I, could, we uh, could, I think that could be sorted. But if we can sort that and see, like, oh, geez, you know, we're spending a million and a half dollars on subs every year, but only a third of it is at the elementary level. Well, all of a sudden, you know, over the last three years, we've averaged 300000 at this for subs at the elementary level, and we just found, you know, three or 400000 to shift back to personnel. Um, whether it's specialists or MTAs or paras or a combination That's of a all three. Yeah. But um, I, I think you have to also sort it by um, the difference between, because no matter development. what level it is, you have to have the long-term a permanent sub. Yeah. I mean, if it, even a high school teacher that goes on a maternity leave or yeah. a long-term illness, middle school, they have uh, you have to have a long-term sub, and you can't say we're not hiring a sub and right. yeah, even that yeah. dissolve the class and send those kids yeah, to the so cafeteria. Yeah, so we have to count for, for so I think some you there. Yeah, you sort it by the $85 a day, um, one day out sick subs. Yep. How many of those were called throughout this last fiscal year? And then you sort long -term what we spent subs. on the long-term and permanent subs, which we know we need to keep yep. that money. Preserve for that. Pr preserve like some sort of average proportion for our element, what we spent on elementary with a little bit of a cushion. Um, because if that cushion still exists at the end of the year, we could reallocate it to pre-purchasing or whatever, you know, I mean, which right. helps us against next year's budget. So it's right. not like the worst thing in the world if we put a $100,000 cushion there that we don't end up yeah. utilizing mm -hmm. because of low utilization this year. You know, who knows how it works out. Um, but I have a hunch that there might be more there than, than, um, than we think, given that it's the elementary school teachers that we're asking. And it's not... A, not a judgment on anybody, but it's just, you know, a, a, a certain reality. Um, so I, w I would be interested in knowing more about that. I mean, we can, if you guys want to start running projections, we could run them against a two or three hundred thousand dollar figure or both. 
but, but I have a feeling that information from those might give us more than we realize. I think it's a great idea, Tom. I, I just think I want to maximize that idea. So what I suggest we do is tonight we start doing our accounting process. I, I just checked my calendar, and um, I think we're going to need to have another meeting Monday night um, for finance in order to get the answers, you know, in terms of what Mrs. Joyce was saying about the contract and the language and what we can do. Um, there's a couple of things I know that um, the superintendent needs to verify <coughs> and check on. So I, I think tonight we get are getting very we get very close to where we're going to be based on what we have. We and then we on Monday. Sorry. We do? Yep. Between now. Monday and Wednesday next week. Oh, Monday night. Oh god. <laughs> Negotiations. <laughs> Good grief. <laughs> Monday and Wednesday yeah. next week. We have certified negotiations. And what do we have? We have a school committee meeting on Tuesday. Could, could we meet for could we meet for an hour before? Just to get some of these updates? I mean we could do that. We could meet um, but we we also have to have a public meeting on the budget. Um, so I mean un unless what we do is we call a special meeting of the school committee um, the last week of school to have the public meeting on the budget and basically ratify our budget. Um, we might have to do that so that we take the time before the school committee meeting on the 17th to finalize what we're dealing with unless we have another finance subcommittee meeting on the 23rd of Monday the 23rd and we Last day of school is the 25th, right? Yeah. Don't we, we have to have our answer by that date, don't we? Are you talking about recalls? Yeah. Well, so Mr. Petronio, with the, the recalls, where the city budget process ends Thursday evening, is that correct? It ends it this, yes, as, well, <coughs> actually, from what I saw on the calendar, it's scheduled through Thursday. They're trying to end it by Wednesday night. So I know last night I watched and they took on a couple extra departments. They already done the auditor's office, they've done the clerk's office, and those were scheduled for later. So I think tonight they will end their meetings. Um, I've asked if there's a way that could give us some assurance on whether or not they were going to make any further cuts to our budget so we can begin our recall process. Uh, I haven't got a definitive answer on that. Um, but hopefully the uh, city council president will either bring it up or discuss it. If not, we'd have to wait till Monday night when they voted it and then this this coming Monday night the 23rd the 23rd and we'd have to do our no it's the Monday afterwards it's the Monday after the Monday afterwards the 16th is right correct their next City Council meet their final meeting for the month of June is I understand the 23rd they would vote it then and then the 24th is when we would be able to with some assurance do our callbacks I mean technically they have 72 hours to change their mind but um, uh, again, if it goes through with the unanimous vote, I think we have no issues to do the callbacks in time. And Dr. Moran is ready with those letters. We met. Um, we're finalizing the letters, um, so we're ready to go. I know she's trying to have everything ready. So as soon as we get word, we'll be able to send those assurances out to staff that are being recalled. Would it be too late to reschedule our joint meeting, given the circumstances? Yeah, I mean, they can either go forward without us or whatever, because, so. Uh, I think we're at a critical juncture. Yeah, I mean. Right now. We can invite the superintendent to the finance meeting. Yeah, we can invite the superintendent. I mean, can we, we make that our open, we have to have a public meeting, right? Can we make that our public meeting and I know just we need reframe that, right? Okay. Yeah, but I'm saying if we met for an hour before our 17th meeting, got all of our information, started making some, you know, kind of really hammering and narrowing down our decisions, and then on Thursday night we had our public meeting, you know, for any public comment, any, any other issues, um, and then that would give, you know, <coughs> the superintendent and her time, her her team time on Friday, before the meeting the following Monday at City Council. I think. You know. But we have to have a school committee meeting where we 
ratify what's what we are doing here in finance. So after the public hearing, we then have to have a school committee meeting to take a vote in terms of all of our final couldn't, decisions. But couldn't we schedule a full school committee meeting that Thursday night? I mean, is there on the nineteenth after the public hearing? We could. Yeah, for the twenty-fourth. Yeah. So so we could have a we could have a finance committee meeting on the seventeenth before our school committee meeting. We could also have a finance committee and a school committee meeting on the nineteenth. Even before the city council does their final vote, Aldo. I don't think we can ratify until they do that. Right. So then that means okay. so that means we have to go to the twenty fourth and we have negotiations. We have negotiations on. Right. The twenty third is their final. So we ratify after them. We don't have to ratify before them. So the twenty fourth is a Tuesday evening. Correct. But we have we have negotiations. Can we do it the twenty fifth? That's the last day of school. That's or is that we, we can't do it. Yeah, that would. Well, so we would let them know on no, the 26th. Well, let me, I, I guess I'll have to find out if we can ratify before the city council finalizes because I think even if we ratify and the city council finalizes and let's say they cut us, it just means we have to then go back and cut our budget. You're still, right. you're still we'll ratifying your budget. Then we'll figure out. So we'll plan on having a finance subcommittee meeting an hour before the school committee meeting on Tuesday night. So we'll post that. That'll be over at the high school. Right, and then and then we'll figure out, and then we'll plan on having a public hearing on the budget the nineteenth, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, and then and then we'll find out, Aldo, if if we can no, in, also in that up. night schedule a ratify a, a special meeting of the school committee to ratify. Right. I'll call Mark Gilday and find okay. out on the who's a lawyer for the city council if okay. we have that ability. And we'll have to let the city council know that we're not attending the joint meeting because of the budget situation. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. This is this is this is quite the schedule. <laughs> I just like to tell all the new members, welcome aboard. Yeah. <laughs> you asked for it. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> oh, and you're yes, Madam Superintendent, your <laughs> first, your first budget. Oh gosh. Okay, so why don't we, do we need to move in order to, is that how you want to do it, Mr. Petronio? Do you want to start with? I was going to put the numbers up there so we can see at the bottom right. um, what kind of, I think you're okay sitting there. I think Mike can just keep the totals up high. You have, you have a microphone on the side too. Yeah. It makes it easy. Or, you know what, why don't you sit here and I'll sit by Mike. Okay, so um, we lost a couple of people. Okay. All right, um, the additional cuts to add uh, the 20 parent liaisons at 221,000. Why don't we put that up there? And you're working off of 36 certified staff members? 
Yes. Yeah. Correct. Right. Um, so then we had what the freshman sports forty thousand dollars. And just to clarify, that this continues all freshman sports, football, soccer, all of them. Yes. Elementary intramurals, fifty-eight thousand. Middle school sports equipment. Oh. Mm. Sixteen. Al, though, we shouldn't make that into murals equipment because that's what we we already cut middle school sports equipment last year. So we took that money and put it into into murals. So just so we don't see the same, we think we're cutting the same thing twice. So, it's, okay. it's, it's so you wanted as middle school into mural equipment? It, yeah, because when we when we cut middle school sports the last time, we we took that equipment and. We put it towards intramurals. Didn't we cut ten thousand and leave just six? And then we added. But we added. Back we added a ten to the intramural budget. So you want to change line sixty-one, Mike? It should be middle school intramural equipment. Line sixty-one. Pads. I like my I'm using a mouse. Yeah, you, no, you can't tell Mike's struggling with it at all. Just <laughs> 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 good with the mouse. This is what happens when you cut technology. <laughs> 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 we couldn't afford a mouse. So we need middle, middle school intramurals at 84000 
about something. Um, if we find that we can get additional funding, whether it be through, you know, somehow through the mayor or the city council or something, is it possible for us to formulate a new set of priorities of like programs that we can start to look at bringing back and at least set a priority priority list so that we know and the public knows that these are programs that we may have cut now but we're going to try to see if we can bring them back if we get additional funding I agree especially I if it happens during the summer right absolutely and, you know after we're through this exercise and it kind of gives us something to hopefully shoot for or right. look forward to and, and to be very transparent with everybody that this and this is what we've decided are our priorities um, the other thing that I will tell you you'll see um, on Tuesday evening and this is you know the hard work I, I thought I saw Laurie did Laurie leave oh there she is Laurie how many are on the uh, agenda for school committee how many grants Not that, we, not that we have these grants, but we also had uh, Wanda Alves uh, made a suggestion, a good suggestion for this agenda, um, school climate transportation grant. It's, it, it'll show you it's a $750,000 proposal. Um, 21st Century Community Learning Center is 100,000. Clean Energy Center, 145,000. Um, I'm sorry. Yeah, clean, another one for clean energy, a green workforce, energy efficiency, 50,000, school redesign, 313,000, adult career pathways, 92,000, uh, a continuation adult basic education grant, 580,000. I'm sure that's the adult learning center. Some of them are, are specific. Um, after school, out of school, uh, quality enhancement, 20,000, 21st century additional learning time grant, 175,000, mass rehab commission, 17,000 DESE extended learning time proposal, 596,000. So some of them are continuation, and, and as Laurie said, they continue to write. And Mr. Minicello also asked me, so I want to make sure people hear us. There are a number of grants that we're, we're trying to understand the language in the grants as far as surplanting um, and bringing on additional positions. Well, if we lay positions off, we don't have them anymore. So are we able to, so I, I and, and I think Mr. Minicello was talking about giving us an opportunity to come back to you by Tuesday night. I'd like to be able to have some answers for you. And this will continue all summer long. So as we identify or grants are awarded to us, wh whatever amount is in the priority list will be a big help. Um, okay. Parent information slash school registration office, abbreviated summer hours. You have one of these. You have one of these. Right? I do. Yes. All right. Some. I mean, I was astounded when we when we instituted some of the recycling opportunities, like the cost savings that came from that. I mean, what, what we were talking about seventy five thousand almost in the first. Ninety three. Yeah, ni ninety three thousand. Um, have we talked to um, Republic Waste anymore about ways to to capitalize even farther on that? I mean, we put recycle bins in every classroom, but there isn't a mandatory policy for recycling. I mean, I know a lot of our teachers are doing it. Most of our custodians are doing it. Uh, Chartwells is doing it. Um, do they see any space for savings there? The, the, the food waste would be our next step. Um, they t I know they talked to us about compostable dumpsters yeah. um, that cost us less than um, cost us less than our uh, our waste disposal dumpsters. H have we looked at any op opportunities? At, you know, Superintendent, I know you were talking about things like uh, Infinite Campus. The the potentials in Infinite Campus, for example, to start to go paperless in a lot of different areas, whether it's letters home to parents. Uh, are you talking the parent portal? And the, the parent campus? portals, but even even the nature of like I, I don't know the ways we communicate with our teachers and things like that. 
they seem small but when you multiply them by the amount of staff we have, <laughs> the amount of students and families we have. I mean, when we first sat down and talked about the recycling program, we were hoping for maybe 20 grand. And it came back as 93 in the first year with really very little effort. I mean, we basically just provided the bins. Yep. We didn't provide education, maybe a little bit of signage. There was certainly no mandatory compliance to something like that. No. Um, you know, I don't know if you have a sense of how prevalent <coughs> recycling is district wide. It, you know, are we, are we at like, say, 70% compliance and realizing 93,000? And so if we can get ourselves to 90% compliance, there's another 25 grand there. Yeah. Those savings were way more significant than I ever expected yep. them to be. Um, not to mention good teaching and learning opportunities for our kids and our families and, and, and other things. Um, you know, do we send like paper report cards home with every kid? Yes. How much yeah. does that cost us if, if we were to you know, move to Parent Portal? You know, I got to imagine if we mail them, print them, all of those things, you know, I don't know what kind of communications we send home. I don't have a student in the schools. So I don't know what kind of regular communications come home from our middle schools that we print and, and put in envelopes and how often we mail stuff. If there are ways to find efficiencies there, I think there's some, some pretty significant, I would imagine there's you know, 25, 30, 40 grand there and then all of a sudden we're talking about maybe being able to bring back middle school intramurals or, or salvage the marching band um, or, or maybe both even. Yeah. You know, I, I don't know if we've examined those. No, and, and as I said, one of the things we did was we put up on the website just to kind of hear what, what our own staff uh, would have to say about efficiencies, and we've had some very good suggestions. I wonder if going forward we can put together almost a task force, you know, th have members, you know, throughout the school system sit and, and look at a number of things for efficiencies, as you said, you know, going paperless, um, you know, taking a look at, you know, recycling, um, energy savers as far as computers on or off or you know whatever it is we can certainly as I said it's it's the tightening your belt yeah I mean I mean we can look at like you know remember a few years ago we looked at closing not allowing some of the buildings to stay open yeah and, um, and I think we have to consider that for mm -hmm. um, some of our cuts that we have um, where I don't know where custodians are going to be um, you know, if these cuts go through, I mean, we have to look at redeploying several custodians throughout the district to get the, the work done, but you might be able to take six or 10 schools and say, they're not going to stay open to 11, we'll close them at six or seven, or as soon as extended day ends, we can close them down at seven, then all the lights go off, and yeah. those are the kind of things we looked at a few years back that we might have to start talking about again. Yeah, I mean, just some of those simple efficiencies that at, at the, magnitude of our the size and magnitude of our district can can become pretty large savings pretty quick i mean the the woman from republic was incredible yeah i mean they they she was surprised as well she was surprised yeah. but i mean they have daily and weekly numbers i mean we we can look at those chart i mean they're expanded charts you can literally look at them and say it's clear that this school is not recycling at yeah. the level of others i mean oh yeah we had where it's 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 incredibly clear or, or, sh or they look at the weights of the dumpsters. The, the dump, they get a call for a full dumpster, but it doesn't weigh as much as a full dumpster at another school. And then they, real, they, they make assumptions about, well, maybe that dumpster's full of cardboard, where we have a cardboard dumpster sitting right next to it. Or those boxes likely weren't broken down before we, we came and picked it up. And I mean, you're, you're talking about a single dumpster pickup at it, several hundred dollars. If that's a twice a week occurrence over the entire school year, you're talking about 15 grand. You know, right, like, <laughs> and it, it's simple. It's one, one dumpster a week. Um, and, and it, so when, when this program started, and, and, uh, maybe you can uh, chime in on it, Thompson. Um, did that include outside trash bins for recycling? Because I noticed, for instance, at my son's school at the George, so you walk <coughs> in the front door, there's a barrel, but there's no recycling thing. So every day no. that barrel is full. But it's all bottles and yeah, we, things that could be recycled. We talked. I mean, when we talked with Allied, we talked about a long-term kind of phased-in program. Um, you know, uh, we started with the offices mm -hmm. and the classrooms. Um, you know, but we didn't talk about shared areas outside of the cafeteria. But for example, like um, 
milk cartons can be recycled now. Better don't mean changing the protocol in the cafeterias. But when you talk about 15,000 kids a day eating in our cafeterias, two-thirds of them drinking milk, you're talking about a, signif I mean, yeah. a significant amount of milk cartons that add up to a significant amount of dumpster waste that can be diverted to a cheaper waste disposal cost for us. It's something we didn't do because it, it requires some changes in the way our cafeteria staff work, in the way our custodial staff work, <laughs> our students operate, and our teachers operate. Um, you know, and so those are things that we can, savings that I know we can realize that we aren't quite yet. Um, you know, our, basically our biggest source of waste from the cafeterias now is our trays. We use styrofoam trays because they're the cheapest. Um, but literally we fill, we use uh, hundreds of thousands of styrofoam trays a year. And then not to mention, outside of the waste, like the, just the mind-boggling amount of waste that that produces, um, it all, those, dump, those trays can only go into our regular dumpsters. There is no other place. I don't know if any of you have ever been to one of the elementary schools or middle schools. Literally, we have custodians who are very thoughtful. Stack the trays instead of just throwing them haphazardly to just conserve room. They put them in bags and they're just they're big square bags and they get into that dumpster and they pack pack every square inch of that dumpster. And then we have those that don't. Now it's not you know we can't expect that of everybody, but but you know when you start saying. We could save three dumpsters or four dumpsters a week by thinking more practically about that. The, the, we haven't switched to the compostable trays yet because it isn't cost effective quite yet. The compostable trays are almost five times as much yeah. per tray. And this, the savings we'd realize doesn't, we haven't hit the tipping point yet. Um, we would spend more than we'd save. We'd be more environmentally responsible as a district. We wouldn't save any money, we'd spend more. And it's not a cost that can be absorbed through chart wells yet. Um, every we examine it every every couple months, um, but milk cartons are. Yeah. I, I read an article a couple of weeks ago on uh, food waste, and there was a uh, new regulations coming down. Is that I'll uh, can, fifty thousand dollars? Do you know about that regulations based on end. food waste? No. No, I, ten, I know it's talking about like hospitals right and some ten. school districts having to comply with new regulations, and, and I don't know, is that a cost that could be incurred by us, or is it incurred by <coughs> Chartwells, or is it something that even affects us at this current time? Not yet. It hasn't been adopted by Massachusetts yet, yeah. but it could if it was adopted. Um, so they say, would, like, Chartwells has the ability to offer us compostable dumpsters. Yeah. What it would require, though, is because we use styrofoam trays and non-recyclable or compostable uh, plasticware, it would require all of our students to scrape so the compostable waste off of their trays, put the trays and the, and the forks and spoons into a different bag. So now we're talking about extra bins on each service line and things like that. Um, but we could divert all of our, we could start diverting all of our compostable waste right now at a significantly reduced cost to our what it costs us to empty a normal dumpster. Um, and and again, 17,000 students a day, probably about 14,000 of them eating, some of them two or three times. I mean, what is Char Chartwell serves 20,000 meals a day yeah. or more in our district. Yeah. Between um, breakfast as well. Yes. You know, multiply that times all that waste every day of our school year for the entire school year. Um, I mean, 93,000 in voluntary, voluntarily uh, recycling. Um, that's basically just paper and, and some of the bulk kitchen waste, the plastic, the, the big plastic bins. Um, I don't know if it's worth sitting down with Republic. Um, yeah, we can bring Diane in, talk to her. And to see if they can project out some potential savings for us. Um, or if it's just worth being less sensitive about um, the trouble that might come from a conversion and just make some things mandatory. Yeah. Sorry, I mean, it's a little bit of a soapbox, but, but I, there's savings there. We've realized significant savings already. Are we, are it's we the right thing to do, to but in a year like this, I mean, yeah. if we can save 20 grand by going to electronic report cards. Uh, what? I have a little issue with that in that on communication, is there any way in this task force would somehow have to 
survey and figure out how many people do not have that connection, yes. because that, that would be would, the primary though, concern. Yeah, that's where the problem comes in. But if we could eliminate, say, three quarters of it, fine. But some way to tell those people that did, that do not have it still can get the communications they need to get on the regular basis yeah, that no. they're receiving it. And, and I don't. I I totally agree, and that would be my primary concern. But but I would guess that, you know, if uh, that those are the same kids who are probably most utilizing our middle school sports and our middle school intramurals and our after school programs. And if they said, well, you know, I can if if I got to even come to my kid's school to see that, and, it, and, and the savings realized saves their entire intramural program. I, you're talking about exchanges now. I mean, we're making we're making the best of bad decisions, you know. But but um, I think you know I don't want to debate the merits of it tonight. But but I think you're right. I mean, it's something we have to look at because it's certainly um, probably likely that a, a good portion of our families don't have regular internet access at home. Right. I think it's something we've wanted to do anyway is to move in that area. Right. You know, yeah. we have a lot of parents that would like to have that instant yeah. access right. to Which many things. Yeah. And we do have the capability and, you know, we need to work with our teachers and find out ways to at least start to, to implement those type of... Even if we could start with the communications we have with our mm -hmm. teachers. Uh, you know, I got to imagine there... I know how much paper we get. <laughs> you know, um, I got to imagine the teachers mm -hmm. get as much or not. I mean the binders that you guys are putting together for evaluation alone. I mean, multiply that by however many Ho teachers we got. Hopefully that's going to change next year. Yeah, I mean, I hope so too, but those are significant costs. Mm -hmm. um, Mrs. Joyce just brought up to me on what was sent home with you uh, on Friday was $50,000 for the high school band and music. Mm -hmm. I'm estimate, it's a low estimate probably at 10, but until I actually, Mr. McCrina had given me a whole list. It did say okay. 10. Well, the 10 is, 10 is, no, it's, it's estimated at 10 until That's I can why clarify. I had that note, cuts don't match, because for some reason mine said 50, but right. it didn't match. Well, so we started fine. out at 50. We started out at 50 saying we'll take a look at a music program. We should be able to at least cut $50,000 in light of what we did. And when we started to look at, and we, we went to the contract, I'm trying to find out exactly what the transportation cost is if we're, I'm looking at marching band. Um, some of the things Mr. McCrina put in front of me. Uh, marching band, football games, all citywide parades, jazz band, jazz workshop band, all city jazz ensemble, choral ensembles, harmonics, jazz choir, participation with the junior senior music uh, district music festival, all middle school and after school choral and instrumental activities, any after school community performances. So that's not, we, I, we haven't gone that far, but I do want to have discussion and I want to put a dollar amount with each so we can take a look. So I'd like the opportunity to sit and spend some time with Mr. McCrina. So you want to put 10, 10, put 10, 10 is, is okay. a, a low estimate, but I'd like to at least put that in there and okay. I'll get back to you once okay. I've met with him. So we're at 10 now. So yeah. Aldo, the ordinary maintenance cost, so back the, to this if you one. scroll down, basically everything we've had here, does that add up to the 403200? Yeah, 403200. Okay, so. Basically, the net available right now is 896,000 with those additional cuts if you approve them all as we just put in. So that, um, that actually, that's actually not enough to call back the 36 teaching positions, but you also have to consider when you do your callbacks, your compliance and uh, staffing issues. And so Go up to the personnel for a second. So we have 36 certified staff members that had been riffed, okay. so and we are trying right. to. So if we if we go down to the substitutes, that will be the next section down, I think. So if we can increase that just. For the heck of it, to 450. Right, well, is there a way to like do an asterisk or something? Well, um, we have it down as 250, and then an additional 200. So okay. Where did you go? Just increase the 200 that you put in, Mike. Put that. 
what, what I want to do is increase it in this section oh, oh, oh. and then up top decrease, decrease it. it. Decrease you know what I'm saying? And yes. I'm not saying exactly where to decrease it because I need you guys to go and figure out based on what Mrs. Joyce said about the contract and, and how if this is feasible by shifting more money you know to be subtracted from the middle section and then we would basically save some jobs on the top section if in fact that is something that is feasible and makes academic sense yes please and that might in in after um after the superintendent and her staff determine you know what really is needed at the elementary level for substitutes then like Andy said we might be able to even tweak it a little more depending on what the you know what the results are so what you're saying is if you can use monitor teachers um, as permanent subs you would recruit um, you would decrease the 17.64 well, the 18 pink slips you decrease it down to say eight pink slips or, or whatever mm -hmm. yeah. and we just put like you got this you counted for the seven there and the minus 225 can we just we don't have to equate a number of teachers yet just put a minus 200 down on that one i'm losing you what are we doing don't we have to apply the 200,000 we just oh all you have to do is go up and change the 30s if you're going to do all teachers with it then change that 36 in that box mike change that to whatever you want so if you're going to you're going to um, probably do about six positions if you did that. Six, nine, yeah, about 200,000, about six positions. So you'd lower that number to 30. And then it would adjust what? Yes. Put the extra 30 in there. Mm -hmm. And then it would be in. Um, well, then go back in there. No, no, no. It's, a, it's got, if you, if you click on the 1,157,000, my formula says, N9, so it's pulling off the N. Change that N to a Q, please. <laughs> when you there it goes. When you continually add to your spreadsheets, you gotta find <coughs> formulas. So now we have now we have eight what do we have? What do we say? Eight hundred? And we only have nine sixty four left. Right? I mean is that kind of what where that leaves us? You applied the 200, though, to certified staff members? I, did, I, I don't know why. I thought we were going to do it to yeah, either could, Paris or... Right, could, right. Well, it just, just needs to be accounted for somewhere right. in there. Could, right, so change could, that back right, to 36. And what do you say? Change that to 36. If you put that and back now, to 36 and the cuts that we just made, could we apply that to certified staff members and see where we're at before we do the 200,000? Yeah. So in other words, we just you just approved or we just wrote in all of the cuts that we talked about. Can we apply that to staff members, the 800 and whatever it was? Yes. Can we see where we're at? Which staff members do you want to apply? Thir the 36 certified Sorry. staff members. Okay. down and remove the 200,000 that we put in for the substitutes. Okay, so so let me just go back now. So the cuts that we've made, we are we have eight staff members that we haven't recalled and that's the amount we need, correct? The 257? That's how much you would need to recall the last. Okay. So I think what Mr. Minicello said, if you go to the MTA column with the $200,000, is that correct? Yeah. Mm -hmm. For yeah. Yeah. If you go with the no. 221 for instance, that's 11. That's apparently yeah. is on the seventeen point six four. Okay, so it's on two hundred thousand. Right. Applied to the MTAs right now to okay. see. Well, just to, yeah, um, yeah, just to that's see. the column you think it should be, unless there's, unless there are. Well, the reason I'm saying the MTAs right now is they. What I do know is they all have bachelor's degrees. Yeah. 
we were talking about the right. level of substitute teachers that you would need. It takes them off of, you know, the being laid off, and it, it, I mean, you can take a look at what you do want to do with that two hundred thousand. Right. I wanted to see how many certified staff members were left, and I will say publicly, we are looking at a couple of grants with phys ed. I'm trying to get some clarifications, but that could certainly help us. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Oh, here's my number here. Phys ed, I have six here. Right. If that's able to help me with six, we're really getting down there. That's why I'm talking about the 200 for the MTA if we're talking. The MTAs or Paris. So what we just showed now is if you took the first grouping of savings, you brought the 36 um, people who are still out down to eight. And by taking the 200,000 out of the substitute line item, and if it works that MTAs can cover as permanent subs, we brought the 18 roughly down to eight. So you called back 10 of them. Okay. So that gives you 10 to cover about 12 positions if there's one per, per building. The only thing we haven't done is there are going to be some compliance, compliance issues with MTAs and paras, one-on-ones with our special ed children, so I'm just... We're going to have to call think, some of them back. That's yeah. why I'm, I'm concerned about the 36 going down to 8. Well, I, I wanted to see it, though. I wanted to see, and as I said, we're, we're looking at grants. I know there are, is some opportunity right away, you know, with the phys ed positions. So right now we're balanced, correct? We're, yes. We're, we're, From we're, all the cuts, if you all the cuts we cut, are balanced. It's within 11,000, which on a... 11 on plus. A, yeah. We're in the green, correct? Yeah. Well, 11,000 yeah. overspent. Right. Overspent. No, overspent. 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 All right. But on when we're calculating, hun, you know, uh, the amount of money we add, the tens and the fifteens of millions of dollars, there's rounding that will take care of that. Yes. Because okay. everything here right now, I'm doing is based on percentages. Okay. So. So. Can, and also, Mr. Petronio, could you talk about some of the other things that we're doing as we reach the end of the year, which. Again, hopefully, when we meet again, we'll be able to have some yes. more figures, whether it be my information from Mr. McCreen or that could go up a little bit, but also. Right. We're looking at the Edison Academy. We're going to look at the overall structure, the amount of programs, the amount of students, the amount of staff time that's, that's going to be needed to manage that. And try and, as opposed to staffing it and then hoping for students, we're going to look to see if we can figure out how many students and then figure the staffing to cover those students. So we can hopefully minimize the cost there a little bit and bring that down. Um, the substitute teachers we talked about, race to the top. I'm working with John Jerome right now on that, and I'm looking to try and come up with another $200,000. What, what I mean by that is, as I balance out this year's budget, as I always do, I charge back the grants. So if I can charge back for his grant, I can put another 200000 into his grant. So we identified 80, which he just told me this morning, Planning on thirty thousand of that for the summer race for the summer Edison Academy project. I said, all right, thirty thousand. You know, we'll, we'll work with that. But I'm working on another two hundred thousand um, in, in getting that balanced out. So that would be two hundred. The Carol White grant is six and a half positions. If we can work through the supplanting um, requirements in the grant, which my take on it is, if we have issued a pink slip and then we rehire, to me that's not supplanting. So. Um, we're going to look at that closely. That might give us some coverage for about six or so positions for the next three years, which would be great on that. So out of those eight, six of them could be... Correct. They're on um, here. Six of them could be health teachers, or are they already accounted for in that? Um, on, on here, just to let you know, I have six phys ed teachers. Yeah, there's six on the list, but those that Carol White grant isn't accounted for in any of these no. numbers. Correct. Yet. I'm sorry. No, it's so, not. So out of the eight left, if, if, if we were to leave the... Right now, identify six of those eight as the six Correct. phys ed teachers. We could potentially recoup those in the Carol White and, and be at two. Right. Yep. Okay. Right. So some of these additional monies that you hear could be put towards compliance. We could go to compliance next. Right. That's, I'm, I'm being selfish when I say that's what makes me nervous because it's my office that's going to get called in September, October, November with, I need another one-on-one. -on -one. I need two more one-on-ones. I need another one-on-one. -on -one. Every one of those for me is about $35,000 every time. And I would say to them, deny it, deny it. And they say, they laugh, and they say, impossible. And no matter how much money you put aside, it seems like we get more and more of those every day. Then they come in, they say, I need to send two more kids out of district. We just can't handle them. They're $60,000 each. So that's where I get nervous with the compliance stuff. Um, so 
with that, we're, we're also looking at other grants we're applying for. And tomorrow we're going to have a meeting to discuss um, some individuals who are interested in the um, early retirement incentive we put out. Now with the early retirement incentive, the way we've always done it is whatever union puts up the retirement, we put those savings back to that union. So if three custodians retire, we look to rehire three custodians. So a meeting tomorrow with, um, with HR and working through um, people who have um, basically shown an interest that I'm going to try and figure out for them financially how it benefits them so we can show them that it's to their benefit. Okay. So for some people, it's not to their benefit, but it could still be personally to their benefit. They just, they've got health issues, they've got family issues, they may want to go. So um, that in turn could also help bring back um, So do you think positions. by... Um, they have until June 20th. That was our cutoff date. Yes. All right. Can you just give us an update as to where you are for Tuesday night yes. you know, at that point so that we can consider exactly. if, you, if you have a strong mm -hmm. indication that you know, a few numbers are strong. You know, so, okay. Five administrative positions. Where are those? This is off the top of my head. Um, one is in special education. One is in the bilingual department. One is uh, 21st century in the community school office for um, the 21st century grant and grant programs. Um, the uh, one is at the high school uh, health and wellness. Yeah. And the other is uh, another position that's district wide, which is library and media services. So, so those are the five. They don't have a direct impact on the classroom, an indirect impact. But not a direct. They don't have a direct impact on the classroom, but it is really stressing the offices, the bilingual, the special education office. Again, talking about compliance, talking mm -hmm. about a number of mandates <laughs> or programs that they oversee, teachers that they support. So when we take away from the bilingual department, it puts a lot of pressure, as it's going to do on all of us. And I've said this to people. Mm -hmm. You know, if you thought you worked now, you're going to have to work more. Right. You know, but I know with um, Jose Pinheiro, Kelly Silva. Yeah. You know, they're pretty much pushed to the limit. So it it imposes more responsibility and more mm -hmm. workload on the people that are remaining in the in that department. It it does in every you know whether we're talking administrative assistance. Mm -hmm. uh, I have two schools that are presently not staffed right, right. now because of the layoffs. Mm -hmm. And we talked today. You know, if if you were working maybe with one executive director, maybe you're now going to work with two. I mean, we're going to have to do some real shifting. Right, and but I'm, starting to. But the reality is, I'm more inclined on filling teachers that have mm -hmm. a direct impact in the classroom, even if specialists, because that has Absolutely. a domino effect on what else happens in the schools. Yeah. Then I am an administrative position. Classroom is our priority. I think we made when we went down our yeah. list. Mm -hmm. First was special education, bilingual compliance issues. We didn't want to jeopardize any of those monies. Second was class size and classroom instruction, school right. size. But I know you're holding out the phys ed teachers right now with the hope that we get that. We can use the Carol White grant for those positions. Well, I'll have that answer for you Tuesday. Okay, good, good. That'll be helpful. All right. Um, so in terms of now, now that we're, quote, in balance, maybe we should take each section, the first staffing levels, and prioritize what we would like to do if we could uh, have the opportunity to sort of go back and backfill. You know what I'm saying? Are you saying you're looking at this list here? I'm not sure. I'm, I'm, I'm looking at the overall oh, I see. staffing I see. Yep. cuts. I mean, um, So in terms of priorities um, on staffing, if we could add positions, you know, what areas would you recommend that we call back? I mean, you've taken out 51 paraprofessionals. Do you think that that would be a line item that needs some further support well, or, it, or it does as we said um, and that's why I mentioned the 200,000 I'd like to be able to go in with whether it be paraprofessionals I'll certainly sit with Laurie Mason and start to identify you know some of the compliance issues 
Uh, so, so like I would pass over right now the MTAs because if if you know based on what is up here we've taken we've we've mm -hmm. brought back a number of them. Yes. So the next you know category I guess would be you know where would you want to put resources to? Um, I again you, you've mandated the monitor teacher assistance and the parent liaisons first. That's who you wanted to bring back because of their support in the classroom. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. So we're bringing back the paraprofessionals, MTAs, and teachers, stuff like that. I think we have to be careful with that because I agree for compliance issues and critical issues, but I'd also like to see us looking at some pro programmatic cuts that we've made that have devastating effects on on the quality of, of educational life for our children. Not not just strictly taking this pot right. of potential money and just putting it into I, personnel I was, only. I, get it, I guess I didn't um, clarify myself. I was just, right now I thought we'd go into each category and prioritize in each category. Within so each right, category? right within okay. each, so around okay. staffing. Then we'll go to pro. Then we'll go to programmatic cuts. Then we'll go to ordinary maintenance. You know what I'm saying? And so each category we would right, prioritize. But what I don't want to have happen is if we do get additional funding that it just all go to staffing and we don't look at any of the programs. Right. Okay, that's all I'm, yeah. I'm okay. saying. So I, I figured since we're on staffing levels sure. on our chart, we mm -hmm. hit up staffing and then we'll go work our way down. If I could, on the um, MTAs, we were saying it, well, they would cover, if it's possible, um, s permanent subs. If we brought back 10, we would need two more to make it 12 to cover all the middle and high school levels. So what I'm getting at is just to, you would need two more of them to make it. So if we were to designate them for that role. Exactly. The equity district wide would require two, similar to like what the superintendent said last week. If we cut one parent liaison, we can't leave one school without a parent liaison. Right. Like it's, a, right. it's an all or nothing. Mm -hmm. well, right. If we're going to look at only calling in subs for elementary and not calling for middle and high school, then we need two more of these um, MTAs to be permanent subs. So, Mr. Petronio, we've covered with the 200,000 in the substitute pot, with, we've only covered 10. Yes. Yeah, we just reduce the substitute pot by two more. So you have to increase the $200,000 cut to about 240000 That's what I'm saying. Right. It's up to you. Well, why don't we do that for right now, and then um, you'll get back to us in terms of what you need for subs for the elementary level. If it's, if it's less, then we have to cut back or we have to readjust. Yeah, we assess it. I mean, just, just for like informational purposes, I'd be interested to know um, the cost benefit. Like, I'm looking at a craftsman and we've had conversations time after time about how one craftsman saves us a lot. Right? Yeah. I mean, if we can read other operational savings by bringing back a craftsman versus just one more MTA or one more para, the impact is greater. Our, our finances, I think we ought to look at that. You know, I think I heard you say, Superintendent, that we have two schools that don't have an admin system. Yeah. And depending upon what those schools are and what their role is in those schools, you're talking about, to some degree, security and safety, um, maybe compliance. Uh, you know, oh, we'd have to staff the schools bit. first. Yeah, so I mean, you know, maybe at least making sure that every school has an admin system. Yep. You know, um, if, if a craftsman saves us more, um, you know, being versus say versus like a custodian uh, or or one more pair. Of, you know, I mean, with cost benefit, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, we're talking about maybe a hundred. You know, we're talking just about a few hundred thousand dollars at this point. And so I feel like we have to be much more can, thoughtful about. Okay. Can would you like us to go back and make some recommendations for you with rationales behind them? Yeah. We have we haven't really set. We've been so busy looking at cuts and looking yeah. to you know, quickly bring people back. I would rather have an opportunity to sit with the executive team, uh, some of them directors, and then have rationales yeah, for what our recommendations are for you. Yeah, so what I'm looking at going back and doing is not only the top section, which is personnel, you bring up a good point about the cost savings uh, with uh, as a craftsman, as an example, 
but we'll go into the programmatic cuts and again we'll make some recommendations and then you can okay okay so you'll make some staffing recommendations and then we can prioritize that is that what you're telling us and if you'd like we'll okay. make do you want us to go into the programmatic cuts or is that an area you want to take a look at which we'll make recommendations to you well one what? of the areas I'm personally really upset about is we already cut the middle school sports to cut the intramural program in addition to that is a double whammy to this mm -hmm. to this um, level this this Stage age level and and then the freshman uh, sports cuts I think and we're looking at music at the middle school that was you another. know uh, yeah so the, the th third tier cuts I think I'd really like to reassess if mm -hmm. we do and kind of prioritize if we do get additional funding yeah definitely yeah. But you're only prioritizing the remaining positions that we're talking about so yep. not the whatever the two eight seven thirteen sixteen one well, I will have an answer for you on the six positions that we're looking at in yeah. a grant, um, and we'll, we'll, with rationales, we'll prioritize the rest okay. and yeah. be prepared. So Tuesday night we have the meeting an hour, an hour before. before the school committee meeting. Okay. Ms. Clark? If possible, I'd also like to see a breakdown of the required um, pair positions for one-to-ones or staffing that's required in the special needs classrooms just to make sure that we're being compliant and that those get brought back so that we have one-to-ones for the students that require them and nothing gets missed there. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, Deputy Superintendent Liz Barry, I know, has been, Kathy, has she been working with you on looking at paras? I know there was, okay, so they are working on that. Okay, all right, so staffing, we know what you're going to do. Mm -hmm. Programmatic cuts, Mrs. Joyce identified middle school uh, intramurals, and I would think hand in hand with that have, would have to be the middle school intramural equipment, right? Looking you at need that one, last group one we requires just the other. Yeah. So yeah. that's $100,000, I think. Mm -hmm. um, it's 84 plus 16. 16. Um, and then, um, did anyone else want to? And then you did mention freshman sports, Mrs. Joyce? Yeah. Okay. And then we previously mentioned intramurals at BHS too. That was twenty three eight hundred. Um, yeah, and that freshman two. sports was. I would what? prioritize freshman 40. sports over the intramurals yeah. personally, but it's my opinion. That was that was the opinion of the and principal, the principal as well. Too. Oh really? She agrees with you. Yes. Okay. Yep. She prioritized freshman sports. Okay. Yes. Yeah. All right. Um, and then maybe the intramurals is something that a grant or some physical, I, I mean, you know, that's something that maybe a, a grant could supplant or something like that. We'll see. Um, anyone else under programmatic cuts, that middle section? Corporate sponsorship. No? Okay. And then I would gather that the ordinary maintenance items, the Bridgewater City Labs, didn't you say that a grant was going to take care of that? Yes. You, so that, moved to grant so that's, funding. all right. So. Mm -hmm. So the other items then. I'd like to look at the uh, old museum and see if maybe we might be able to address that in that $15,000 number that we had spoke earlier about. Okay. Identify Fuller Museum. Uh, and honestly, if we get there, I think I'd like to maybe take a second look at some of the My Turn money, given who it supports. And, um, I, I, you know, it, I think it's low on my priority list overall, but okay. but if we're we'll put picking things out of yeah. each one, yeah. I mean, given that that my term money focuses on the supports for first time, you know, first generation college um, students, and also knowing we're already short staffed in regards to guidance and 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 others, uh, I think it'd be worth a look to see if we can do anything for them. Okay. Anyone else? Ms. Clark. I would like to look at the substitute teachers closer and the effects that that's going to bring on the high school. I know now that there's classes that get staffed and the cafeterias are still full with students. If we only have one teacher per each cafeteria, what effect is that going to have? We wouldn't uh, have one well, teacher in each cafeteria. We'd obviously have staff that would pull down well, there for duties. Yeah, Floor teachers would help cover. Yeah. 
But the, like you're right, there's no there's no instruction going on. It is a study, but there would be more than just one teacher supervising. Okay. Any, anyone else? Mr. Jordan. Electronic pad, and that's all you need. Hit it, yeah. it's gone. We're not responsible for that. I believe the money was put in the budget because Just in case. we didn't have the information as to how it was going to operate. Uh, fortunately, the fingerprinting uh, company is actually here in Brockton servicing a lot of um, school systems in southeastern Mass. And the other part of that is, it, my understanding is, it's a, co it's a cost that is being borne by the employee, just like a license would be a teaching license. And I want to say it's $55 for certified staff members. I think it's uh, 35 for non-certified staff members. And I think there's even a clause in there if there's a hardship. That program also includes, say, like our student teachers. Everybody. Oh. Just like you would Corey them, you would fingerprint everybody. So fingerprinting is basically a part of the routine Corey process and all that stuff. Right? Dr. Moran, do you want to speak to this? Or? Um, yes. Fingerprinting is just because um, we are required to start with We have to come before you with a policy, just like we did with the Corys, um, to talk about exactly who gets fingerprinted. Student teachers, the colleges have been um, informed that student teachers need to be fingerprinted prior to starting with us in, in September. Um, so we'll, we'll be discussing that further in terms of um, Corey versus fingerprinting. Okay. From a contractual standpoint, is that considered a uh, part of their uh, uh, condition of employment? Anyone else? I give up. Um, all right. I think that I think that everyone knows the direction we're going, and you know what you need to do to discuss with your staff, especially prioritizing the staffing level positions and letting us with rationale. Right. Yeah. Um, and those other items um, with respect to whether or not our hypothesis regarding the mm -hmm. substitution alternative mm -hmm. is doable. Um, and then you'll find out about other the grants where we're at with that, right? Yes. Alicia, did you, Mr. Petronio? Just um, this is the net school spending side. On the non-net side, just want to remind that we are still seven hundred thousand dollars short of what we requested. Um, Mike Thomas and his department is working on how we manage that cut, um, primarily is in the number of buses and the number of crossing guards. So I know he's still working that out right now. He's out visiting every site, and he's looking at our bus routes. So um, that's something we can deal with over the summer. Correct? Exactly. Yes. Okay. We don't have exactly. So we'll put together something with that over the summer. Exactly. And, and that'll be Mrs. Joyce's committee. Yeah, we can do it. Yep. Okay. yep. All right. So can we just to get ready for Tuesday night because we only have an hour. Can we list the top what we're exactly going to do on Tuesday so we can move through the meeting without to make sure you get all the information you need on Tuesday night because again we're only going to have an hour so it'd be good to put the agenda together now so we can move through that meeting so when we when we have to break to go to school committee at seven you make sure you feel good about what you have so we stay on task and not for the you know because an hour goes by quickly obviously so if we can come up with the four agenda items that we need to make sure you need information on. So it's basically um, the substitutes where we're getting, correct? So we're not missing anything. The substitutes where that money should, you know, how much we need to spend on the elementary schools. Yep, and if the proposal that we discussed tonight mm -hmm. is, is feasible. Feasible, yep. Feasibility, I guess, feasibility. Um, and then uh, 
prioritization regarding staffing, yeah, prioritization that regarding um, programmatic cuts. Um, we need to have numbers for about special ed compliance as right. far as one on ones yeah. for IEPs. Yeah. Yeah. I still want us to. Yeah, compliance issues. And that's I will is. also have an answer to you. Uh, we talked about the grant. Um, Carol White. You know we have. Yep. Right. Yeah. And any other good news you may have regarding grants? <laughs> that's that's addressed to Lori Silver and Karen Watkins Watts. <laughs> and Heather Riggi and, and Shauna Gray and okay. I think Mary Beth O'Brien and oh. I, say, I think they've all got been a whole writing team. grants. All right, good. Yeah, we, all right. Our, our, our <laughs> grant. <laughs> Whoever our, they can grab. A grant crew. That's good. You may even bring Mary Beth McManus back, who's been working on our strategic <laughs> plan. I bet you will. Okay, any further business? Anyone else? All right. Motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor? Adjourn. Thank you. <laughs>